Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar from the Institute of Export and International Trade about the social impact of e-commerce. My name is William Barnes Graham, the executive editor at the Institute, and I'm delighted to be bringing you today's webinar during what is a landmark week for the digital trade sector. Yes, that's right. This week is e-commerce week, a new campaign from the e-commerce trade commission encouraging more UK SMEs to trade internationally online. This is the second webinar we're running as part of e-commerce week. And in the chat, you'll see that I've posted a link to the recording from yesterday's event on how businesses can grow international sales online. To begin with though, on the next slide, it is my delight to start introducing our excellent panel of speakers today. Okay, thank you. So I'm delighted that Josh McWilliams, the head of UK exports at eBay, has been able to join us. I'm sure that eBay will be familiar to many of you, and the platform is indeed a board member of the e-commerce trade commission I mentioned just now. Josh has plenty of trade and retail experience, having also previously worked as a retail consultant at Capgemini Consulting. Josh is joined by the Institute's very own Karen Holden, a trade strategy and project specialist who has had many years experience supporting businesses of all sizes to trade internationally, including at the Department for Business and Trade as a trade advisor. Currently working in government is Michael Kearney, the head of business engagement at the Office for Product Safety and Standards, or OPSS. Michael works with the business community to ensure OPSS understands the wide range of business views that are out there and that businesses understand the current regulatory agenda from government too. And finally, really delighted to say we're joined as well by Renee Parker, an advisory board member at British Beauty Council, who also currently leads the strategic advisory practice, I think it's Avinci, and has previously worked at Amazon UK. A brilliant panel, I hope you all agree. On the next slide, though, before we get into the presentations, we're going to run a quick poll to find out a little bit more about you, our audience, and particularly what you think is the most important social aspect of e-commerce trade. The options being labour and skills, environmental impacts, consumer safety and standards, inclusivity, and if you say other, please do say in the comments, it'd be great to hear what you would mean. While you're answering that poll, some quick housekeeping notes from me. Firstly, you can contact me with any comments or questions using the control window, which is usually to the right hand side of your screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions today, but please note we cannot guarantee we will get to every question in the allocated time. As such, I will be prioritizing questions that are relevant to the wider audience, so I won't be going into company or sector specific queries as such. And please note that if, you are, if your questions are short and clear, I am more likely to be able to read them. Finally, you will receive a recording of a webinar in a follow-up email we will be sending over the next day or so. So I'll give you all just a couple more seconds to answer the poll. So the options being labor and skills, environmental impact, consumer safety and standards, inclusivity or other. So just a couple more seconds and here are the results. So, Consumer safety and standards is top of 50%, uh, labor and skills 25%, inclusivity 25% as well. Not so many people saying environmental impact, um, interestingly enough, so I wonder if that will change over the years to come. However, on the next slide, it's at this point that I'm gonna hand over to Karen from Institute, who's gonna say a few words about the e-commerce trade commission. Over to you, Karen. Thank you, Will, and it's wonderful to be here this morning with everybody at this webinar. Uh, just to give you a little bit of information about the E-Commerce Trade Commission, it's actually the UK's first of its own kind industry-led trade commission that was convened last year in June. It was uh, formulated as a result of a recommendation from the Social Market Foundation's report of November 22, that actually said that if we could encourage 70,000 SMEs to be working in e-commerce and exporting through e-commerce, it would actually add 9.3 billion pounds to the UK economy. That's an amazing statistic. So the actual 
e-commerce commission was created to bring industry bodies together to actually reach out to that potential 70,000. We have a very, very strong um, board member and the commission partners that we work with um, uh, uh, encompass the Association of International Couriers and Express Services, Alibaba, Amazon, eBay, the Federation of Small Businesses, Google, uh, another trade association, the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales, uh, Shopify, and also the Department for Business and Trade sits on the commission. And that allows the smooth flow of feedback directly back to policymakers, which is a, a big part of what the Trade Commission is aiming to do. We're looking to identify barriers that SMEs face. We're also looking to work with policymakers to break down these barriers. So a, a very uh, interesting opportunity for us. And uh, this webinar today is the second of one of those that we're actually um, running during the very first e-commerce trade week, which the Commission hopes will actually become uh, a, a fixed industry event in the calendar. So thank you. Back to Will. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And uh, I've posted a link to the e-commerce the, the e Commission in the chat and I'll shortly be posting some links to our social media channels as well so you can follow us to, to get a sense of what else is going on this week as part of e-commerce week. However, if we move on to the next slide, it's, uh, yeah, let's get on with today's panel discussion about the social impact of e-commerce trade. And my starter to ten, for, for 10 uh, to the panel is, what do we actually mean here by social value in e-commerce trade? So I'm going to focus to each panelist and as you kind of uh, answer, just a reminder to say a little bit about who you are and where you've come from today. And I'll begin this question to Renee. So Renee, what does social value in e-commerce trade mean to you? Absolutely. So um, thank you for having us. Again, I'm Renee Parker. So I'm here in the capacity of being the growth pillar president for the British Beauty Council. I'm sitting on its advisory board. In a past life, I was a, a banker and I'm still an investor um, and uh, worked at Amazon, yeah, leading their, their premium beauty business for four years. In my capacity today beyond angel investing in small businesses and female entrepreneurs, most of them in beauty and beauty tech, um, I support businesses of all sizes um, in selling in online marketplaces, in particular Amazon, both in the UK and abroad. So I, I see every day the impact that um, you know access to commercial trade and access to online channels can have on businesses. From my perspective, a uh, social impact uh, in relation to business is ideally the more widgets you smell you sell um the the greater impact you have in a positive way on people and in the environment and opportunity both from a perspective of your supply chain and in terms of what you're selling um, so from my perspective the beauty industry um, checks a lot of those boxes which we'll come on to later um, but it's it's a really powerful industry to want to grow from a social impact perspective Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. So it's almost a social impact of the things you're selling on e-commerce itself, which is the, an important thing to note. If I bring in now Josh uh, from eBay, do you want to say just a bit about yourself and your response to the initial question, what is the social value? What does social value mean when it comes to e-commerce? Yeah, it's also great to, to be here. So I'm Josh McWilliams um, and I've been at eBay for over 12 years now. I've had the the, the pleasure of doing a variety of roles from category management to shipping and logistics. And I now head up UK exports, which I've had for the last couple of years. And that is basically growing any UK seller selling to a non-UK buyer. And I'll go into a bit more detail about how we can help you on the platform later today. And then in terms of the question, it's a real thought provoking one, which I kind of had a, a good think about. And I think the definition of social value in e-commerce can kind of be split into into two i'd say non-financial and financial and i think the non-financial side at ebay we prioritize a lot around the circular economy so products like refurbished tech pre-loved fashion and also we do a lot around charity so we make it really easy to do charity donations and on the financial side which is probably where i'm more based is is kind of relevant for exports 
I think the greater you sell, it translates into more jobs, which in turn creates like more of a financial and economic um, social value. And on eBay, we have access to over 200 countries, uh, which will ultimately drive sales uh, above and beyond the domestic business. So that's kind of what my feelings are around the social value of e-commerce. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. So non-financial is circular economy and charitable kind of donation side of things, but financial, the more sales, the more jobs, the more economic value, really important point as well. And Michael, uh, from the Office of Products Safety and Standards, I'll shorten that to OPSS from, from now on. Could you say a bit, a bit about what the OPSS does and also your response to this initial question? Yeah, great. So thanks, William, and, and, and thanks for the invite. It's great to be able to come and uh, address the audience. So I'm uh, Mike Kearney, I lead on business engagement for OPSS, so really just trying to talk to businesses across the sectors that we regulate, ensure that their views, their concerns and challenges inform what we do as a regulator. I've got a background in, in product regulation that goes back quite some time, so uh, yeah, I'm uh, a regulator through and through. Uh, in terms of the, the question at hand though, I guess I'm approaching it from two angles. So the first is with our kind of OPSS hat on, we're all about protecting people and places from product related harm. But we sit within the Department of Business and Trade, we're a directorate within DBT. Obviously the department as a whole has a huge focus on supporting businesses to grow, to invest, both uh, and to trade both domestically and internationally. So we're keen to see that businesses exploit the opportunities that come with e-commerce to reach consumers in an efficient way to grow their brand and grow their market share. Um, and we also want responsibility, uh, we also want responsible businesses in particular to, to thrive when they do so uh you know their customers benefit but wider society benefits too you know um i think josh has touched on the economic benefits but you know a, a strong growing economy underpins public services and brings a really wide range of uh, kind of wider societal benefits but just returning briefly to the office of product safety and standards our concern is that growth in e-commerce doesn't come at the expense of consumer protection we don't want we don't want to engender a situation where uh, responsible businesses are kind of undercut by those companies who are not acting with due regard to safety, environmental and, and wider social impacts. We think the ambitions of the department and, and ours as the regulator OPSS are very much aligned. Essentially, we think sustainable trade flourishes when responsible businesses build trusting relationships with suppliers and consumers. And the various frameworks in place can underpin and ultimately support that ambition. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Some really uh, important messages there. Um, and I think particularly, yeah, you brought in that protecting people and place from products uh, is really important as well. So thank you for those points. Karen, anything to add from, from your side? I suppose I'd just add, as an individual, as a consumer, um, in terms of, of, of what it, it gives me as a, as a shopper, is it gives me freedom of choice. Um, and I want to be able to shop when I want, how I want and cost effectively and as the rest of the panel have, have, have said in a safe environment um, and I would imagine most consumers are looking for, for that safety and that reassurance. Really good point thank you Karen it's uh, both the consumer as well as the business and the broader economy as well I think that's really important. So that's uh, hopefully got the conversation started I think it's some, some great answers there already Rene, if I can come on to you uh, next. So obviously you're on the advisory board for the Beauty British Council, uh, which recently in 2023 published a report called The Value of Beauty. And this uh, is a great report. I would really recommend it to anyone listening in. It really puts a spotlight on the power of sectors such as the beauty sector to promote entrepreneurship and in doing support social mobility. Could you say a little bit more about this report and how it relates to today's topic? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the British beauty and personal care industry um, is really special in a way that most people don't understand or they underestimate. So this industry is diverse. So it's made up of scientists, manufacturers, consumer goods executives, therapists, colorists. And in terms of GDP contribution, it's, it's massive. So uh, in 2022, um, the British personal care industry supported a total GDP contribution of 24.5 billion pounds in the UK. So that's actually bigger than the UK's creative industry, the arts industry, the entertainment industry, 
uh, and the aerospace manufacturing sector individually. So I don't think that, you know, prior to this report coming out, people had been so clearly, you know, uh, so clear about what the definition of the industry is and its impact. 28% of the revenue that comes from the British beauty industry comes from online channels. So that peaked uh, during COVID at 40% and came back down to 28% and it's growing every year. The other interesting thing about this industry is that it's got a GDP multiplier of two. So for every 1 million pounds that it generates in spending, the beauty industry supports another 1 million um, of contributions elsewhere in the economy. So it's got this really powerful network, this network effect. Um, and if we move on from just the size in terms of, you know, contribution to GDP, it's really an interesting industry because of who works in it. Um, so it certainly touches consumers. All of us use beauty and personal care products. We hope when done right, these products support our mental health. They support our hygiene. They support, you know, positive self-reflection, self self-impact. But the people who work in this industry are incredibly diverse. So there are over half a million um, employed people in this industry, which actually means one in every 50 jobs in the UK is a beauty industry job. Um, and unlike other sectors, uh, we over index in entrepreneurs. So micro businesses, SMEs, people who are working flexibly. flexibly. So 40% of people in this industry are actually working part time. So you can imagine that means a lot of women, that means people returning to work, that means people at different stages of their career, um, supporting families and supporting their communities. Um, and then finally, the really interesting part is that almost half of the people working in the personal care industry, half of these jobs are actually established in the local authorities that are um, most underserved in terms of unemployment. Um, so you've got beauty you know beauty professionals who are working in poorer populations in poor communities and they're contributing really positively also because it's so inclusive to allow lots of different types of people to participate it's easy to say and to argue that the beauty industry is uh, you know one of the biggest avenues for mobile sorry, for upward mobility um, so it's a really powerful place and has a really powerful impact on on the economy what a what an amazing answer! It was so much I kind of don't know about the scale and the size of the beauty sector, uh, which is really quite remarkable. When you say kind of lay out like lay out like that, one in one in fifty jobs being in from the sector, the multiplier to kind of network effect, and twenty eight percent of the kind of sales being online channels makes makes this really relevant to today as well. Regarding e commerce in particular, I mean, what role do you think providers like eBay, Amazon, Shopify, among among others? Uh, have yeah. to play in assuring that this digital trade from sectors like beauty have this social value? So I think, I mean, the first thing, there's lots of things they can do, everything from helping to ensure that the products that are sold online are safe, you know, as other panelists have, have touched on, um, also incentivizing the right types of products to be sold, both from an environmental, you know, a safety perspective. Um, and then they have a role to play both domestically and in terms of supporting foreign trade. So um, yeah, the UK beauty industry exported 4.5 billion of personal care products in 2021. So that's actually 1.4% of the total UK goods export. So the beauty industry is a major exporter. Obviously um, brands, especially SMEs, have struggled to bring that number back up post Brexit. Um, I'm shocked in my day-to-day -day job, even medium-sized businesses have really been um, you know, put off by the cost or complexity of exporting. So you see companies like Amazon, and I know eBay and others go even further, but from Amazon's perspective, um, certainly the onus um, is on the brands, but Amazon actually has an EU VAT registration service. They've got, um, you know, you can get, uh, they have uh, logistics support, so you can, brands can get products into um, the continental Europe. From there, Amazon does make it very easy to both in an automated way, translate those listings and then ship, trans ship to other countries so that, you know, small brands can get into the, get their products into the EU in a compliant, you know, consumer friendly way and then sell across, across Europe. So I think there's quite a bit they can do. Um, I know that a lot of these companies, including Amazon, also have bring brands in um both from a domestic and export focused lens 
to, to reward them for sustainability, to reward, you know, different types of entrepreneurs, to provide grants, funding, training. Um, I, so I think just both in an automated way, in a structural way, but also in a programmatic way, you know, in opening their doors and inviting inviting people in and entrepreneurs in and making them part of their community is, is super important. And I see the impact of it. Um, some of the brands that I work with today were actually have been proactively contacted by Amazon and offered a lot of training and support free of charge. And now they've gone on to have sizable businesses on the Amazon channel, which I'm sure was Amazon's plan, but a lot of people are benefiting along the way. Great answer again. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. And I should point to a webinar we did yesterday, actually, where we had um, Sol Retail or Stevenson's Online uh, as an example of one of these businesses who have really gone on that journey with Amazon and growing their business through e-commerce internationally um, in particular. So yeah, I've posted a link to that webinar yes, uh, in the chat already. Josh, it'd be great to bring you in on this point as well. So I mean, obviously you're here from eBay, one of the, the major platforms. So could you say about how eBay in particular is, is supporting uh, businesses uh, with e-commerce and with their kind of social value of that e-commerce as well? Yeah, so I think, um, I think a lot of items alluded to by Rene in terms of how challenging it, our focus in terms of selling internationally and how easy we make it at eBay but in the post-Brexit era I mean I can't believe we're still talking about Brexit what three years down the line but it's something which is still impacting selling internationally I hear it from sellers all the time it's such a challenging place to be but in terms of how we're helping sellers at eBay so I manage a program um, it's marketplace beating uh, and we intermediate exports for sellers fully. So we make it as straightforward and hassle-free as a domestic sale. So we manage the custom forms, we manage the category eligibility, we manage the international shipping leg, and if there's any issues with that product. So we intermediate that fully um, to make it as straightforward for sellers as we can. And that will then drive, we've seen up to sales up to 18% globally which I think is a real positive impact going back to the social value where sellers can unlock that international opportunity. It's great for a wide range of businesses, whether you're a small business um, or a larger business and you don't have the skill set or the time to focus on that international complexity. And therefore you can focus a lot more time on your domestic business. Um, so I think that's just kind of the key thing that we're doing at eBay. We want to make it as straightforward and easy to access that international market. Terrific. Thanks, Josh. I mean, uh, as you say, it can't be we're still talking about Brexit, but I, I suspect it will be for a few more years yet. But it's great to hear some of the support there from eBay, particularly, you know, making these international sales feel as domestic as we can through, you know, support such as what you're describing just then. I mean, the thing that strikes me, and I'll bring in Karen in a second on this, is that international trade, you know, itself has a social impact. I mean, we often talk at the Institute about how uh, global trade, you know, helps to break down barriers between communities, helps to kind of create economic ties and drive prosperity around the world as well. So by helping more businesses to trade using e-commerce, you're, you're accentuating the, the benefits of global trade more broadly. So at that point, Karen, I mean, we're hosting today's webinar as part of the Commission's campaign to promote opportunities that are out there for UK SMEs online and internationally. What importance is the Commission putting on this increased trade um, as having that kind of social value? I mean, how important is social value to the Commission's mission? It has to be very important because we're all consumers um, and those of you that are businesses are all involved in actually delivering services to individuals and communities. So I think the, the Commission certainly puts a, a very high emphasis on improving that for, for all users. Um, and I, I alluded to, to the benefits as, as an individual, and this obviously, as, as you rightly say, will transcends communities. It brings people closer together, it provides a lower cost opportunity to access products from all over the world that you wouldn't maybe have without the opportunities that e-commerce brings. It, it also hopefully reaches some of the more marginalised um, people in our communities, maybe people with mobility restrictions that can't actually physically get to 
bricks and mortar stores as as many would and it, it also allows people with different working patterns that work shifts to be able to trade um, and also as community as consumers to, to be able to buy products to be able to uh, view choose uh, and actually purchase things in their own time when they need to and I think we've, we've talked about the elements of market transparency and competition and that all obviously has a, a positive impact both on the business side of uh, e-commerce as well as the consumer side and the environmental issues were, were very concerned I think as individuals and as businesses and as organizations of the environmental impact of what we do and anything that we as either a, a commission or as, as individuals and businesses can do to improve that situation can only be a, a force for good and as you rightly say well we we see international trade as being a very positive force for good and we need to encourage and do more and not be complacent and keep obviously all the good works that we've heard about going and it can be continuously improving on that so that consumers feel safe confident to be able to purchase online and that circular economy keeps turning thank you thank you karen some some really great points there and i mean at this point we we're talking about the consumer side of it now as well and, and encouraging them to keep keep this kind of circular economy moving well, you know, related to that, Michael, there's, there's obviously a lot of value in e-commerce and entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurship, but there are also, you know, some pretty well-documented societal challenges that it poses as <coughs> well. So, I mean, from the consumer perspective, what are the major challenges that OPSS is kind of seeing in, in ensuring that marketplaces are safe bases uh, for consumers? So, I'll just begin by, by giving a quick shout out to the cosmetics sector so we we regulate cosmetics and we work extensively with the ctpa which is the main trade body supporting business kind of navigating the regulatory frameworks and uh and doing a great job of, of growing the sector and providing super products to consumers so yeah just to echo what renee was saying we're um yeah it's a great example of uh kind of uh, businesses trade associations standards and regulations all all coming together to, to help to help grow a sector um and there's a risk I'm, I'm going to be the kind of curmudgeon on the panel here because I'm just talking about negativity so I, I, or, or kind of challenges. And I just wanted to get something slightly positive in there. So thanks for bearing with me. Uh, in terms of those kind of consumer issues, though, um, our, our minister, Kevin Hollenrake, is, is absolutely clear that he wants consumers to be as safe when shopping online uh, as they are when they shop in a bricks and mortar uh, establishment on the high street. And that's a, that's a noble ambition. I don't think anyone would, would disagree with that. As a regulator, our prime concern is the availability of unsafe and non-compliant goods via the marketplaces. We've taken really quite significant action in recent years on, on problem products. Um, we've seen some real harm associated with products containing glass and batteries, um, uh, strong magnets, which can be ingested by children, and most recently, the kind of products associated with lithium-ion and uh, lithium-ion batteries and e-bike fires, some uh, yeah, significant issues that people are perhaps picking up in the, in the press. So it's obviously unacceptable that unsafe products are available. And we have a program in place as, as the regulator to buy and test a proportion of products from, from the online marketplaces. And we've recently published uh, some findings on that work and we're seeing around an 80% non-compliance rate in the products that we're buying, which um, is, is not good enough to be, to be frank with you. Uh, that's 80% of the products uh, that we're targeting. That's not 80% not of all products online. I just wanna caveat that. Uh, we're, we're looking for the bad actors, the bad companies, the, the problem products. Um, it, the position is clear, really. Businesses need to comply with their regulatory obligations. We, as the regulator, are, are here to provide some support and some assistance. But compliance is not an option. It's down to the businesses to get this right. And we do take action against businesses when they make unsafe products available. Um, but the benefit of today's discussion, they're sort of broadening it out ever so slightly, we see uh, kind of product safety compliance as, as, an, in, as an, an indicator. Um, if businesses are not taking these responsibilities seriously, they're probably not doing the right things in terms of uh, kind of wider supply chain issues, whether that be, um, you know, labor rights, sustainable sourcing, IP, you know, it's just, it, it's a pattern of behavior that um, I think we need to address. Um, ultimately, if, if, if irresponsible businesses 
or bad actors go unchecked. Not only do we kind of miss out on deriving some of the social value that we're also keen to see, but we risk kind of amplifying social detriment. So I think it's a incumbent on all of us within within this sphere to make sure that we that we drive best practice and encourage uh, businesses to take their obligations seriously. Thank you, thank you, Michael. So, uh, I mean, I guess as you say, it's it's the bad actors which you know make it harder for for everyone else. I mean, I guess just in terms of you know companies who are trying to be you know compliant and trying to do the right thing. I mean, what's what steps are being taken to 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 help you know those companies? Um, and kind of what role as well do things like uh, you know standards? I'm thinking things like you know ESG or what kind of broad standards? What, what kind of role do they have as well to play? So that so that challenge around the kind of risks associated with e-commerce is is almost universal. Um, our counterparts in the US, the EU, Japan, Canada, you know, you name it, um, they all have the same kind of menu of, of concerns, and they're all taking steps to refine the regulatory frameworks that, that cover these uh, these um, aspects of uh, you know product availability to make sure that. Everyone within e-commerce supply chains is, is clear on their obligations and responsibilities, and us as regulators have the, the tools and the powers that we need to take action. Um, in the UK, we're currently reviewing our own product safety framework. Um, if anyone wants more information on that, they can, they can catch up with me offline. I, I won't go into any great detail, but essentially we want to make sure that the, the framework that governs these products is fit for now and also fit for the future, that it's flexible and can adapt to whatever, whatever things look like in 10, 15, 20 years' time. In terms of standards, so OPSS is the, the lead within government for standards and accreditation. We kind of own the policy relationship with BSI and UCAS, which I'm hoping people in the audience will be familiar with. And so we really do see the value in standards, whether that be product standards, those more gener generic ones that are, are focused on ESG and other, and other areas. Ultimately, they sent standards that are really useful benchmark uh, that responsible businesses can use as a, a kind of toolkit to navigate what can be new and complex areas. Um, they, they work kind of in, 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 uh, in coordination with regulations. So typically we think of regulations as setting the, the kind of minimum standard and then standards are developed by industry, usually volunt you know, they're voluntary and it gives businesses the, the kind of roadmap to not only to comply, but to also arrive at some, some great best practice outcomes. So yeah, we're um, yeah, a passionate advocate for both uh, kind of compliance regulations but also the, the value of standards in that in that, um, in that arena um so yeah that's probably enough for me on that point no that's great thank you thank you michael some some great points there once again so uh, i'm just going to finish this part of a question with a broader question for for the panel as a whole really um and uh, i'll start with with karen for this one um but the question is you know looking ahead um what are the major upcoming you know, challenges or big threats which are maybe coming to e-commerce and e-commerce uh, sellers uh, from a social perspective? So, you know, is it things like AI? Is it regulatory changes? We've mentioned the environment already as well. So what are, what are the big things which uh, listeners should really be paying attention to? I think we've, we've probably touched on quite a lot of them in terms of um, looking at product safety. That obviously flows into some of the areas of um, information that, that, that consumers are provided with about the products that they're actually buying. Um, the, there are many threats, but I think we must keep this in perspective and that it, it isn't all doom and gloom, as, as Michael was saying. Um, we do have concerns about security threats, and I think we seem to be seeing more and more opportunities for um actors that don't have our best interest at heart to to sometimes be um looking for information that that would obviously put us at a disadvantage so we're all concerned about security threats data breaches um but i think there are some great positives with technology and advances and you you touched on artificial intelligence will and and that will give huge benefits to both industry and consumers, the opportunities for sort of personalised shopping experiences where algorithms can analyse your shopping choices and your preferences. So I, I think it's about putting it in perspective. It's great that we have regulators and we have bodies that will look after our safety, be it financial or be it from 
environmental and, and consumer protection sides. Um, but we must think about the positives that it brings as well. And I think AI will bring amazing positives for us. Um, it, it reduces things like human bias in, in buying opportunities. It, it connects communities like we've talked about before, translation services where maybe consumers across the world in a, an online chat can be talking in different languages that are simultaneously translated. And the power of that is, is, is absolutely amazing and, and we shouldn't underestimate it. So that ability to connect and engage, to build communities, using AI powered chat box, things like that, I think really is a positive. And I think the commission, whilst it recognises some of the areas of negativity, wants to encourage and motivate and inspire both consumers and businesses to, to do their best work in, in order that everybody has a very positive experience. Thank you, thank you, Karen. I think it's really important as well. I mean, I, the question came across maybe slightly but they gloomy, but as you say, there's a lot of opportunities as well. Um, so let's move around the panel. Uh, who wants to go next? Uh, uh, Renee, do you want anything to add to, to what Karen just said? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, for, yeah, from my perspective, as long as, you know, people like Karen and Michael continue to do, you know, the great jobs that they do and keep us all safe, um, the biggest risk that I see is that um, small and medium brands are just not prepared to move fast enough from a commercial perspective for all the benefits, actually, that even beyond the threats, all of the benefits that these tools are going to bring. You know, even in my own business, six months ago, we said the word AI once. Now we say it, you know, 10 times a day minimum. So I think it's just all of us in our capacities doing the best job that we can to bring people along the journey here so that the benefits of these new tools can be really widely dispersed what i would hate to see is that you know the the only the big and strong benefit um from the advantages that these tools have because they really are even lowering the barrier to trade further in most cases um so i think just keeping the social lens on and making sure that we're being inclusive um, and democratic and really supporting so that as many people as possible and as many businesses as possible can can benefit from this kind of new world that we all appear to be racing towards. Really, really great point, man. And really uh, at the heart of what the commission's all about as well in terms of making this work for SMEs as well as you know bigger companies who've got obviously great advantages on these in this sphere. Uh, and Michael, just bring you in. Any, anything to add there, just you know from the from the regulator sort of perspective? Yeah, I, a, a couple of quick points. I think. First is just around maintaining consumer trust and, and the kind of credibility uh, of, of, uh, of the marketplace. We've seen a kind of proliferation in recent years of, uh, of platforms and some really great and innovative new ways of engaging with consumers. All, all of that is, is positive. Um, I think we just need to make sure in what is quite a dynamic environment that uh, everyone is, is playing by the same rules and, and uh, operating with the same kind of responsibility and standards in mind. That's the first point. And then secondly, um, I don't think it's, a, you know, uh, it's not a threat, but I guess the, the biggest, the most dynamic area from, from the regulatory perspective is around, um, I guess, the journey towards net zero, which is ultimately going to see quite a change in how we think about product design and life cycle. And I think um, we've all got quite a journey ahead of us there. Uh, you know, OPSS regulates I think, you know, some, some of the waste and environmental aspects of the kind of DEFRA regime. And um, yeah, that's something that businesses are going to have to start thinking about, and uh, I would I would suggest start thinking about sooner rather than later because uh, that that seems to be where most of the change is coming from. Thank you, thank you, Michael. It'll be really interesting to see how that kind of unfolds in, in the next few years. Um, Josh, I mean, absolutely, really great to hear your perspective on this from the platform's perspective. Kind of what, what do you see as the big things coming up for for e-commerce uh, businesses? Yeah, I think what I've seen over the last couple of years is it's it is harder to export. I mean, there's lots more regulatory challenges, but I want to end probably more on a positive sign um, because what we see is experts are reporting that there are there's growth in this market. Um, McKinsey report uh, report that we're going to grow by three x by 2030. I think from my experience. There are lots more providers that are getting better at supporting export. So the carriers post Brexit are becoming much better at 
um, delivery duties unpaid and delivery duties paid, something which just wasn't used before Brexit, obviously due to the challenges into Europe. And I think there's lots of other providers, tax and duty providers, platforms like eBay with our intermediated solution and all the great stuff that Amazon are also doing in that space. I think over time, there are lots more opportunity to export. It is becoming more straightforward um, because there's so many great additions and providers and the carrots are getting better. So I think there are challenges, but I think we're becoming better at managing them. And I think there is definitely opportunity for small businesses um, to grow more into that export and, and more internationally. Thank you, Josh. And it's, it's such an interesting area of the kind of intermediary kind of sector, including through e-commerce in terms of the raising of standards in that sector has been really marked since, um, since, since Brexit and it continues to be a key agenda, I know. At this point, it'd be good to give the panel a bit of a breather. So we're going to just take a quick pause on the next slide. And we'll come back to the panel in a few minutes, uh, just for any questions from the audience. But before we do, just a quick plug to say that if you are new to exporting and would like to get support to learn how it's done well and what common pitfalls to make sure you avoid, then definitely do sign up to the Institute's Introduction to Exporting e-learning course. This digital course covers all the key areas of international trade a business needs to familiarize themselves with to export successfully and with confidence. And it's something you can study on online and complete in your own time anywhere in the world. So exporting is a great opportunity to grow your business, but if you don't do it with the right knowledge and processes in place, it can also become you know, difficult and there can be cost of that as well. So do make sure to get the advice you need on courses such as this. I'll just launch a quick poll uh, where you can say if you'd like to be contacted by us for any further information about that course. As people answering that poll, Karen, uh, thank you for sharing your insights just a, a few minutes ago. I thought that was a really, really great panel, really interesting um, kind of spread of kind of social issues we discussed and how e-commerce kind of connects to all of them. What, what were your sort of main conclusions, you think, uh, particularly from a business perspective, if a business is listening to that? What, what do you think they should be taking away from, from that panel discussion? Ed, obviously from all of the panelists, how trade is a, a, a positive force uh, in business and that there are opportunities to learn and to grow and develop your business. And uh, I think the comments made from both industry perspectives, looking at the beauty industry, from Renee and also from Josh in terms of platforms, that this coming together and, and working together for the good of both consumer and the business is, is a very positive step forward. And I think we're, we're all mindful of um, the, the need to be more eco-friendly. Um, so some great, great thoughts that have come through. Um, some of these ideas are reflected in the website that we've put up to support the Trade Commission and, and we've largely followed three pillars of the looking at how we support entrepreneurs and inspire businesses to start in e-commerce and then for those businesses that are currently trading we have an education pillar that inspires them to look at training and opportunities to actually grow and develop and obviously exporting tends to come in that linear path and we have a pillar around export where we have some case studies and some information articles that really do extol the virtues of what international trade can bring to, to a business. So I think there's lots of positivity out there from the industry as a whole and the commission obviously wants to echo and support all that. Terrific, thank you. Thank you, Karen. And as mentioned earlier, we've posted the links to the commission in the chat in case you want to look into it in further detail. Uh, finally, before we get into questions from the floor, uh, on the next slide, uh, just a quick reminder that the Institute provides plenty of support for businesses that are new to exporting beyond just training and webinars like this. Membership of the Institute gives you access to a range of benefits that help your business succeed overseas, whether that's guides and insights on trade trends and regulatory changes, access to our team of uh, trading customs experts via the technical helpline, as well as networking opportunities with fellow traders and trade professionals. I'll post some details uh, from this slide in the chat shortly. Um, but yeah, do, do get involved if uh, you'd like to take your exporting journey to the next level. Anyway, let's go on to the next slide. We'll do some questions 
from the floor now. And we, we've been mentioning sustainability a bit. Uh, we've had a question come in from Martina, who says, um, tracking emissions is becoming increasingly important for businesses, particularly with ESG standards and carbon taxes coming through. How can e-commerce businesses keep on top of the emissions through their supply chains and sales? Uh, how can consumers also be, become more aware of the emissions involved in the goods they buy? A chunky couple of questions there. So um, who wants to take that one first? I mean, Karen, do you want to talk to, about it from maybe the um, you know, tracking emissions in the, in the production kind of process a little bit first? So I, I think we're all keen to see that this transparency in the ESG area and that um, platforms and, and players and individual businesses trading actually are accountable for the emissions. And, and I think as the transparency grows, consumers will feel more confident in actually buying certain products from certain providers. Um, but it, it certainly is a very important area, definitely. And I guess, Michael, from the, you're mentioning some of the work you're doing of DEFRA as well in this space in terms of uh, particularly waste stuff, I think you mentioned, but I mean, how how can businesses go about this practically in terms of uh, the, the reaping that zero? Well, it, it, is a, it is a challenge and, it, and I think it is a step change. I don't, I don't think there's a, you know, things like product safety are pretty well established and, and pretty well understood. The people have been making and selling safe and compliant products for years. There's lots of expertise out there that people can avail themselves of guidance. Trade associations are well set up to support and so forth. On some of the, the, the more environmental or kind of sustainability focused side, it, it can, I think, from my discussions with business, all feel a little bit abstract. It's quite difficult making it tangible, making it real. What are the steps we need to take as businesses to, to gather information, that give, us, give ourselves assurance that it's accurate, correct? So, um, yeah, not an easy one. My, my, my advice, such that it is, and it's somewhat out of my remit, but would be to talk to, talk to trade associations, find support from government. Uh, there's, there's quite a lot being done within DBT and also in DESNIS, the kind of um, uh, energy security and uh, energy efficiency side of Whitehall. So there is support out there from, from the government and, and elsewhere that um, those new to this or, or struggling to navigate would, uh, would benefit from, from taking advantage of. Thank you, Michael. Uh, anything to add for Rene or Josh? Or are we happy with... Uh... Good stuff. Let's move on to a uh, next question then. This one comes in from Dominic. Uh, this is an interesting one. So he says, during the pandemic, fast fashion was highlighted as a, a, an efficient trend. Um, what can be done to address trends like this and how can businesses ensure they manage things like returns a bit more responsibly? I know it's, it's maybe not quite in the beauty sector, but is there anything you've noticed from kind of the beauty sector in this sort of area, Rene, in terms of, you know, making sure kind of consumer patterns are also um, being responsible as well? Sure. I mean, this is always the million dollar question. And I don't think that um, brands want to overproduce. In fact, they do, you know, at risk of death, especially as um, cost of goods have gone up. Um, in, fa in fact, I've seen a lot of the opposite. So I don't work in the fast fashion, obviously, or even the fast beauty space, but we, we've been running out of stock and been stuck with long lead times and seeing the, the penalties that, that that can bring along with it. Um, but in general, strong demand planning is key. This is where e-commerce can be really useful because if you look at a platform like Amazon, they are going to have kind of algorithmic uh, forecasting and predictors that are moderately accurate, um, where they're not just analyzing, you know, how your products have sold and the, the phasing and trends of that in the past, but they're also looking at similar products. Um, so this is where I think brands just can continue to get sharper um, and, and be as res responsible as possible. Um, that said, I think that they are and except for in the really, really, I suppose, very cheap and very fast sectors, brands are naturally incentivized to, to be careful, um, as careful as they can. There are also other options today as well that I think e-commerce can provide. So there are other websites that serve as places to sell, you know, end of life stock. Um, so I think brands kind of 
continuing to be creative so that when mistakes do happen and overproduction happens, um, the answer isn't destroying stock, the answer is finding finding a home for that. Um, the British beauty industry has something called Beauty Banks as well, which is a nonprofit that brands can donate um, overstocks or just out of the goodness of their hearts, um, hygiene products that go to people who need it in the UK. So they're, they're, if you're creative, um, there's an option to get product to people who will use it. That's great to hear. So it sounds, sounds like a great initiative. And any anyone else in panel want to add anything to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love to add more to that. I think the eBay is really nicely placed um, where we do focus a lot on pre-loved fashion in that space. Um, we have lots of brands selling on the platform with um, season minus one as well. So it's just making sure that there's a full spectrum of value that's being sold through especially in the fashion sector i think ebay is that we focus a lot of time on that circular economy which we alluded to before but i think with the high end fast fashion with a high return rate i think something like ebay is a great opportunity for that and we see that a lot with brands as well Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Renee. I hope that was a useful answer to uh, Dominic, I believe it was. And so one last question. This one has come in from Harry, who says uh, e-commerce relies on a huge and interconnected workforce. Uh, what are platforms doing to ensure there's kind of positive value in all parts of this labor force? Um, Josh, I'll, I'll give that to you initially if, if you want to. Uh, but I guess it's how is you know, e-commerce and uh, kind of skills, how do they kind of tie together? I think it's a diff it's a difficult I'm trying to think in terms of how we run it it's diff it's a difficult one because we're a marketplace so we connect businesses buyers and sellers I think from my perspective um, it's just making sure that culturally eBay encourages the kind of right working we're doing the right things around regulatory the right things around the circular economy and really en enabling businesses to to do it in the right way um, and I think there's no way it is we can directly influence that labour force but I think in terms of what we do on the marketplace it's just making sure that we very much think about how we encourage the positive culture and connect buyers and sellers in the right way. I think that's, that seems a pretty pretty strong answer, Josh. I mean, uh, Karen, I mean, maybe to bring in the Institute's perspective, obviously the Institute does a lot of training um, in the sort of skill space for customs and trade. So do you think there's a role there for, for education in the kind of social value of e-commerce? I think there definitely is a role for education at, at all levels. Um, and the, the, the better informed you are, the better you will perform. But uh, I think there are also wider perspectives that the Commission will be interested in in seeing developments with sort of looking at, at fair wages and benefits across um, different geographical spaces. And this often applies to some of the major traders where they will be sourcing products or maybe uh, manufacturing offshore. So I think it's looking at the areas of labour rights, protections for employees in, in different countries, and, and actually doing the right thing by the, the people that actually produce goods for you. And training and development within those teams is also important, so that organisations actually have career paths for employees to grow, to flourish within a particular employer. Uh, it, it automatically then leads into diversity, inclusion, and, and Josh touched on culture and the culture of organisations creating the best places that people can for people to work in and then for people to do trade and business in. So I think it's all it's it's all part of that circular economy, and, it, and it's very important that uh, businesses and marketplaces shout about the good things that they do. Um, because there are a lot of very good and positive actions that are, are, are going on and sometimes it's very easy to, for, for the media to track the negatives and therefore it's good to see the positivity that's actually happening in the in this space and across multiple different sectors. 
Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Well, unless anyone has anything else to add to that, I will start to wrap up. So a, a big thank you indeed to, to all of our panelists today, to, to Karen, to Rene, to Josh, to Michael, some really great insight there and some great advice as well, but also just, just some really stimulating discussion, I think, about what is a really hugely interesting discussion, uh, kind of topic in terms of the, the social value of e-commerce and trade, because it's, it's not always talked about, but it's definitely there. So thank you all of you for, for your thoughts today. Uh, I'm going to, on the next uh, slide, I'm just going to do one last poll, and this is just to see if you'd like to be consulted by the e-commerce trade commission as a part of our research into the barriers and opportunities that are, that are there for digital exports in the UK. Um, really important really that if, if you are you know, keen to support the Commission's work to, to, to feed into it because the, the advice we give to government, the Department for Business and Trade will really only be as strong as what SMEs like yours do say to us. So please do uh, save at the poll if you'd like to get involved. Uh, we do various evidence sessions uh, across the UK and uh, we'll be doing some policy papers later in the year as well on the, the barriers that exist. So yeah, as, a, as people on that poll, just like to say thank you again to the panel. Uh, I think we've really delved into the social opportunities, but also challenges that e-commerce trade poses. So I hope that's been, there's been some practical nuggets in there for you as well in the audience as you embark on your own e-commerce journey as well. So thank you to the panel and thank you everyone for your questions too. I'll leave the poll on for just two more seconds. Three, two, one. Great, thank you. And if you move to the next slide. So here you will see some of our other upcoming webinars, including our final member exclusive lunchtime learning session before Easter, which is on export controls and licensing. That's taking place tomorrow at 12 o'clock. Our next free webinar is then going to be on custom solutions for exports to the EU. I something we've talked to touch on a little bit today, in fact. So that's on the 10th of April. Uh, for information about all of our kind of exciting opportunities and events, please do go to export.org.uk for such events. I've put a link into the chat as well. Finally, on the last slide, uh, just a reminder, well, thank you again for listening, but just a reminder that we will be sending a recording of today's webinar in a follow-up email, which you should get in the next day or so. Please do get in touch. If for any reason this email doesn't come through to your main inbox. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us in today's webinar. Please, as you leave, let us know what you thought of the session and any suggestions for future topics by completing the short exit survey. But for now, bye-bye. <laughs>